Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Michael Atlinger. I direct the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of today's co-host, which is the Carsey School, uh, which we're based in Durham. Um, we're a terrific school of public policy. There's some lit around here if you want to read up on us. Um, also sponsoring today is the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service here at the law school. It's a terrific center where I am honored to be a faculty fellow, and uh, uh, we're fortunate to have its director, John Gravy, up here. So well, thank you, John, for uh, co-sponsoring this. And then we have Results for America, which is a great nonpartisan, bipartisan organization based in Washington working on evidence-based policy, and I've known for many years the two heads of that, Michelle Jolin, who is not here, and David Medina, who is. Uh, and they've, they've been leaders in this area for a long time and done terrific work. Um, now, since we have a presidential candidate in our midst, and this is part of a series of events bringing in candidates to discuss important policy issues, I will read you something written by University of New Hampshire lawyers. I know this is the part you've been looking forward to. <laughs> Me too. This event is co-sponsored by the Carsey School of Public Policy and the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service. The use of the University of New Hampshire's facilities for this event does not constitute an endorsement by the university. The University of New Hampshire does not endorse this candidate or any other candidates or organizations in connection with this or any other political campaign or election. Has everyone got that? Good. All right. Now I will quickly introduce uh, Jed Herman, who is the who is result for America's vice president for state and federal policy implementation, and he will take it from here. Thank you, Jed. Uh, thank you, Michael, for having us. Uh, Thanks to the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire and the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service for welcoming us here to your campus, uh, both in 2016 when we hosted an event and again today. Uh, it's great to be here to discuss with key federal policymakers about how our government can and should harness the power of data and evidence to advance economic mobility. It is my pleasure today to introduce our featured speaker. Michael Bennett is the senior senator from Colorado and a former superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. Uh, he's devoted his career to fighting to make our education system work for all people. In Congress, working with Democrats and Republicans alike, he made sure the bipartisan Every Student Succeeds Act, which authorizes our country's largest K-12 education programs, are focused on building evidence of what works for students and ensuring that federal funds are increasingly invested in evidence-based, results-driven interventions. More recently, Senator Bennett has been working with colleagues across the aisle to build support for the FINISH Act, which similarly uh, authorizes higher education to fund what works. So please join me in welcoming Senator Michael Bennett. Thank you for the introduction. Well, th thank you, everybody, for including me here. It is really a, a privilege to be here and, a, and an honor to be talking about education, which I think is the most important domestic issue we're confronting as a country, and it's not getting enough talk in the campaign. Uh, so the fact that you're putting a forum together on the topic is really, really um, important. I also want to say I started off the day, and this is my non-political observation, saying in an office that if everybody in um, Washington were like um, Warren Rudman or Gene Shaheen, I don't care which one you pick uh, across the aisle, we'd have a 90% approval rating in Washington, not a 9% approval rating in Washington. And it's a reminder that there still is the possibility for us to send leadership to Washington, D.C. that we can be proud of and that can actually help solve the problems that we need to solve. And nobody needs us to solve these problems more than the school kids living in America, the kids in my old school district in the Denver Public Schools, a, a, a district where most of the kids are kids of color, most of the kids are kids living in poverty. There are about 95,000 kids in the Denver Public Schools. Our school kids can't uh, fix their own schools, although they can help fix their own schools. Our kids can't address the immigration issues that we face as a country. They can't address the climate issues on their own that we face as a country. They are working hard every single day to try to learn to read, to write, to contribute to their democracy when they are the ones that are going to be sitting where you are sitting today. And that's why we can't accept the politics that we have in Washington, D.C. right now, because if we do that, we're going to leave them high and dry. I know how hard our kids are working in, in their schools, the kids in Denver being just an example of kids all over 
America, and I know how unfair it is for them to live in a country where uh, their education, our education system actually reinforces the income inequality we have rather than liberating students from it. That may sound like an exaggeration, but it is not an exaggeration. In America today, uh, the best predictor of the quality of your education, this is Raj Chetty's work at Stanford, the best predictor, speaking of evidence, the best predictor of the quality of your education is your parents' income because, among other things, that's a really good predictor of where you're going to live. And what that means when you've got a country that for 50 years it ha has had no economic mobility for 90 pe 90 percent of the American people, and then on top of that, you've got an education system that doesn't uh, liberate people from that situation, but actually reinforces it. We've got huge challenges on our hand as a as a as an economy and also as a democracy, because democracies, as you know, do not do well if you have no economic mobility or if if you have massive income inequality, which of course. Uh, today we have. So I have always been interested in education. I was interested in my own education. I never thought I'd become the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, but uh, um, after I'd served in business and then worked for John Hickenlooper, our, um, our mayor in Denver, the school board came to see me and, and they said, we'd like to think about, we'd like you to think about being superintendent of schools. And as I say, I knew nothing about K-12. That was obvious to the teachers and the principals in the school district and <laughs> others as well who often said to me, it's obvious to us that you know nothing about what we do. In fact, the first, I committed to go to every faculty in the district and have a meeting every year because uh, I didn't know anything about K-12, so that sounded like something good to do. It turned out no superintendent had ever done that. And the first year I showed up, meeting after meeting after meeting, it was exactly the same. It would be in a room just like this, maybe in a in a high school or middle school or an elementary school and people would be sitting there and they'd say well we were here before you got here we're going to be here after you you've gone and by the way you don't know anything about what we do that was a long year i have to confess <laughs> but by the second year when i showed up again first people were shocked to see that i had come back and they knew enough by then to know that i had listened to the things that they had said during the course of the last year the evidence that I had collected to make um, changes to the reform effort that we were, we were making in Denver. And 15 years later, I mean, we're not perfect, but if you went back there what, and you asked principals, you know, what is your job here, they still would tell you our job is to change the system, not to keep it the same. And most teachers that you talk to in DPS would say to you, our job is not just here to be here to teach the kids, but it's to be here to perfect our craft as teachers. And that culture is something that took a long time to build. It's not perfect. We still have massive achievement gaps in the Denver Public Schools. But Stanford just released a study about two months ago of the Denver Public Schools. And what they found was that the kids in Denver are growing so much faster than the kids in the rest of the state that it's as if the kids in Denver have 60 additional school days a year compared to the kids in the rest of the state. And on a 181-day school year, that's not nothing. And it's proof to me, it's evidence to me, that we can actually move the country forward and that we can expect something much better, in particular out of our urban school districts and rural school districts, where too many of which we've sort of given up on. And, and that's, of course, tantamount to giving up on our kids who have exactly the same intellectual horsepower, whether they're born rich or poor in this country, and deserve to be born in a country where if they're born poor, they have the opportunity to, to, to fulfill their talents and to serve the democracy and to serve our economy. Washington's partisanship hasn't helped us work on education. A rare example of that was the Elementary and Secondary School Act reauthorization where Lamar Alexander, the chair of the Education Committee, who himself was the Secretary of Education for George Bush, was very kind in including me in the work that we all did together to make sure that we could put some evidence-based language into Title I and to some other things to, to, to just give a nod to the idea that it matters, you know, that we need to see and fund things that actually work rather than things that don't actually work. And it's one of the, it, it can inform not just the policy conversation, I'll stop here, but the political conversation as well. If you took a focus group of Americans today and asked them, uh, what does the Democratic Party stand for when it comes to education? The answer that you would get from the Democratic Party, from, from the focus groups, probably is free college. 
uh, when what the evidence tells us is that free preschool would be a lot more valuable than free college, a lot more progressive than free college, and figuring out how to how to have the 70 percent of kids that are now graduating from high school but never going to college um, either put them on a path to college or give them the skills they need to be able to do to earn a living wage when they graduate from high school, not a minimum wage. If we were focused on that as Americans, we would transform the lives of millions of people and we would transform the American economy. I was at the vocational high school in Manchester a few months ago and and the kids there were working on a hovercraft, you know, and in order for that to make sense in a in a K-12 setting, you need to have evidence, you need to have rigor, you need to make sure the kids aren't just wasting their time. These kids were not wasting their time. And at the end of the conversation, I was sort of getting ready to go, I said to one of the young women that was working on this who was a senior, what are you going to do when you graduate from here? And she turned around and she had a huge smile on her face and she said, I'm going into underwater welding. And I said, I'll bet that pays pretty well. And she said, it pays incredibly well. And I, and I just believe is in our future what we've got in front of us is a much more incremental approach to education where we're not thinking about uh, preschool, K-12, higher ed and apprenticeships is something that's separate, but where we'll actually be focused largely on the transitions among these different things so that we know that every kid as they go through can stamp a passport that says, I'm ready for the next part of the journey, and that we don't have a whole bunch of kids that are falling behind from the very beginning who never have a chance to participate meaningfully in our democracy or meaningfully in this economy. If we don't solve this issue, and we can, um, we are not going to recognize this democracy in the 21st century. If you, all you do is extrapolate the academic outcomes we have against the demographic changes that are happening in America, uh, the failure rates that we have today will be the failure rates of the entire country. And there's no reason for it to be that way. But I can tell you this, there is almost no evidence that the current system as it's organized, and I'll be a little provocative here, K-12 or higher ed is going to deliver what we need in the 21st century to keep up with the global economy and the demands of this ever more demanding world that we're living in. So I went on much longer than I intended to. I apologize for that. But thank you for having this as your topic. And I'll sit down and I'm glad to answer whatever questions people have. Thank you. <laughs> Which one would you? OK, thanks. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Maura and uh, Meryl to join us here on uh, stage here. Um, There's okay. three M's and I'm one D. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Medina counts as an M. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to the UNH uh, Carsey School, the Rudman Center, for hosting us. Uh, today, uh, it's my privilege as one of the founders of uh, sure, Results for America to sure. help moderate this discussion. Uh, as Jen, my colleague, mentioned, we're a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to help local, state, and federal policymakers use data and evidence in their decision making. And so today uh, on our panel, uh, we're joined by um, uh, Meryl Levin, who is probably a familiar face to many of you. Uh, she's a social documentary photographer. Uh, an adjunct professor at uh, Southern New Hampshire University and uh, founder and executive director of the Mill Falls uh, Charter School in Manchester. Uh, and we also have Maura Siegel, the uh, CEO of uh, Achievement Network, uh, a nonprofit organization that is helping uh, over 940 schools in 26 states uh, improve education outcomes through focusing on great teaching. Uh, focused on data uh, and standards and evidence. And so I'll begin our discussion by asking uh, Senator Bennett a few questions, uh, but you will also uh, have an opportunity to submit questions for our panelists. Josh Inaba from our team, Josh, if you could raise your hand, will be walking around with little note cards. Please include your name, affiliation, and any questions you may have for our panelists. And uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, so, uh, Senator Bennett, um, uh, your biggest education uh, successes in Congress so far have been bipartisan, uh, from uh, enacting the, uh, uh, the most far-reaching evidence-based provisions in federal K-12 through education programs, uh, to leading the charge for uh, an evidence-based higher education uh, uh, law. Um, this is almost unheard of these days. 
why do you think bipartisanship in general is important and in education policy in particular well i think it's the only way we're going to create sustainable change somebody asked me the other day in a town hall i was doing whether democracy whether western democracy was what she asked could solve climate change which is a great question and sort of the existential question of our time and i think it applies to education as well you know because it's not enough just to make policy or to, to pass a law you have to have a durable solution that can last you know in the case of climate a generation the class the case of education you know more than one administration because the people out in the world that actually have to implement this stuff which is not politicians in washington but is principals and teachers and kids and superintendents and families they need to have enough predictability so that they can actually um, uh, so that they can actually make a difference and so that means for all of us uh, that the implication of that is that we can't accept the politics we have in washington right now because the politics down there is a politics it at best you put something in and it lasts for two years and the other side rips it out. In fact, if you succeed in putting it in, it becomes the reason the other side wants to rip it out and that becomes a badge of courage. You know, can I destroy what they put in? Put it in for two years, take it out, put it in, put it out. Put it in. And, and pretty soon that creates a level of policy and political incoherence that the people on the receiving end can't make any sense out of it. Whether it's, you know, businesses that need predictability from the tax code or whether it's people that are actually trying to do the really hard work of teaching and learning in school districts. That's why I think it's important for it to be bipartisan. Great. And uh, Meryl, you've been a, a longtime education activist here in New Hampshire. Um, what in Senator Bennett's approach to education resonates with you? And uh, have you seen uh, similar approaches uh, being implemented here in New Hampshire? So I speak from a place of um, kind of on, on the job training, <laughs> um, and uh, but really even bring you know my sense of what I saw through my camera lens, which is kind of you know what I witnessed and then what I witnessed now in a school setting. And I think um, the idea that our very youngest learners are where we have to begin. You can't start the conversation at the end. You have to begin at the beginning. And um, there are lots of reasons. I hope we'll have some time to talk about that a little bit later. But I also think that um, your understanding that education is a basic right in this country, and not just education, but quality education. Um, I think that's also a really important piece. And I think that um, you know the emphasis, too, and you didn't speak about it here, but I've heard about you speak of it in other points, is um, identifying, attracting, and keeping talent in the profession of education and then paying them appropriately so that it's a living wage but not just a living wage but it's a professional wage and it's something that um, we see other countries have made those choices and there's no reason why we can't make that same choice. Great. And uh, Morik, um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, Achievement Network model and mission and how um, it is aligned with uh, the evidence uh, uh, drive within ESSA that uh, Senator uh, Bennett helped uh, uh, and act. Sure, happy to. So my organization's mission is to work across the country in K-12 schools uh, to support making sure that every child, regardless of where their background is, can show up and get a great education, quality, rigorous, engaging instruction, regardless of classroom, regardless of grade level. It's a guarantee for every child, and our focus is making sure that that supports kids of color, kids who come from um, high poverty communities. And so we, I loved what you said about um, the change you made in Denver Public Schools. I think our focus is getting principals of schools to see themselves not as building managers, but as instructional leaders, supporting how you use data um, as part of the learning process for adults in the schools to support the learning of students. So in terms of talent development in school systems, if you, the only way you're going to get students to learn is to have climate and culture in schools where principals are supporting teachers to learn. Um, and so we have um, had, our intervention is to coach school principals to support that change and our research, we have a rigorous research that comes from um, the I3 grant that shows that schools that we supported over two years got six months more learning. Um, than the control schools. And with that as our background, um, we have grown into so many new states thanks to ESSA, and one state in particular. We came out of Boston, and we've been working mostly in urban areas. I told you we worked in Denver Public Schools for a long time. Um, we never would have been able to find a place like Humboldt, Nevada, 
which is a rural county in Nevada that's the size of New Jersey in geography. Mm -hmm. 3,500 kids, and we never would have gotten an a opening there if not for the fact that that state embraced the provisions in ESSA in terms of looking for evidence-based providers to support the schools in that county. And so as a result of ESSA, it translated to the state policy and state provisions that translated to Achievement Network, or ANET, coming in supporting Humboldt, and that county in just one year got five times the gains in ELA and three times the gains in math um, because they prioritized an uh, evidence-based provider. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's yeah. good to know it actually. It's, it's working. Know. It is working. That, that was one we of the goals. We need more states to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> one of the goals of today's uh, event is to show how um, important federal policies are to make uh, uh, make change in partnership with school districts and with state education agencies to, to fit around their goals. So, um, sort of better a follow-up question. Um, I think you know more than others uh, how uh, important ed evidence in education are to improving education outcomes. but. Um, not many people th see evidence and data as education tools or, frankly, as civil rights tools to make our system more equitable. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your thinking? There? That's a great question. So first of all, there isn't a reason for the federal, in my view, there's not a reason for the federal government to be involved in education other than the civil rights impulse. There's no other reason. You're not going to ask people in Washington to pick your cu curriculum. They're, you're not going to ask people in Washington to, to train your principals, nor should you. I mean, I used to spend a lot of time when I was superintendent wondering why everybody in Washington was so mean to our teachers and to our kids. And it turned out I went back there, and it turns out they're not mean. They just have absolutely no idea what's going on in the schools and classrooms in this country. I mean, they think they do, because like 250 years ago, some of them even went to school. <laughs> but the schools <laughs> changed a lot since then, and, and they haven't you know, necessarily changed with the time. So that's, that's one piece of data that's important for them, for the policymakers there to understand. School doesn't look the way it did. It's not going to look the way it has. And that's okay. What else looks the way it did 300 years ago? You know, if medicine looked as close today as it did 300 years ago that education does today, we'd be saying there's something seriously wrong here. And that's, we're, that's what we're confronted with. Very specifically in terms of the use of data, we've learned a lot about how not to use it and how to use it in education. So the, the most important thing No Child Left Behind did which was George Bush's much maligned education initiative, was it forced states and communities to disaggregate their data for the first time so we could see how kids, more affluent kids were doing compared to poorer kids, kids of color were doing compared to white kids, and we could at least identify those gaps, you know, and come to grips with it. Well, we, we've identified those gaps. We haven't yet come to grips with it because the first iteration of kind of how you measure kids was, was built on what's called status, which meant we're going to measure this group of fourth graders and we're going to compare them to how last year's fourth graders did, which I can tell you is of no interest to fourth graders. They, don't, they, they want to know how they did. They're not interested in how last year's fourth graders did. It's not of interest to teachers. It's not of interest to principals. We built an entire accountability system based on how did last year's kids do compared to this year's kids. And in Denver, we thought that was wrong. So we created something called the School Performance Framework, which was a growth model, very heavily focused on growth, not, not status, that took our kids um, and, and measured their progress over years and compared them to every other similarly situated kid in the state and measured their growth compared to those kids. And all of a sudden, the, you get to see, if you look at data like that, when you see a bunch of poor kids in a school that everybody has always said is a failing school, are actually outgrowing some of the most more affluent kids in our district. It gives you the opportunity to look at that and say, what are those folks doing? You know, or more powerfully than that even, if I'm in a school where there are kids who are similarly situated to the kids that are there, and I see those results, it gives me the opportunity to go there and say, what are you guys doing that we're not doing? How do we learn? So it, it shouldn't be surprising that we screwed it up to begin with, but I think that um, the, and that we have to refine it over time. But if you don't have data to make these decisions, then you're just acting blindly. And, and, and you're, you're as likely to cover up the civil rights injustices 
that exist in this country as you are to identify them, which is why in the education context, I think data is particularly important. Great. And uh, Maura and uh, Meryl, uh, Senator Bennett also talked about uh, universal pre-K. Um, do you support that idea? Uh, and uh, can you imagine, you know, if we had universal pre-K, what would this country look like 20 years from now? So uh, here in New Hampshire, where most of us in the room are from, um, you, we just decided to, you know, if you want to, offer a full day kindergarten program in your school or district in October, I believe, was when the budget passed. So we are quite far behind what the national picture looks like and what you're seeing in other places, um, although it's clear that those youngest learners need to get into school because school is a social experience. And so first you have to figure out, you know, how do I function in a classroom? How do I deal with other little people and a few big ones in the room? Um, and, you know, how do you move from there? So I, I think the incredible importance on the social level is key. And then preparing them to be ready to learn as first graders. So it's a pre-K, kindergarten. I'm, of course, kind of biased talking about the Montessori model, which is a three-year cycle. So there's kind of a beginning, an introduction to the idea. You practice it in your second year. And by kindergarten, you're like... I got this. And then you're ready to move into the next learning community and the next level. And I think that that's an incredibly important piece. There's all this work that has been done about brain development in those very early years and how important that piece is. I worked with um, Save the Children's Effort here to try and educate New Hampshireites about, um, you know, what is the value of pre-K? What might that look like? Um, and there are some unbelievable organizations within our state here that have been working on that for years and years. Um, and there's still a fair amount of work to do. Um, it's not a funded thing here in the state, so um, public schools generally with a few exceptions, can't really offer that program. Uh, but uh, obviously, the whole world is doing it. So, I mean, and, and not, not that we imitate everything the whole world is doing, but this is one of those things that we ought to jump right in and, and absolutely do. It's where all the research points. So. Yeah. Well, I just appreciated your comment about the continuum um, because I, my organization does operate in the K-12 space. And so to the pre-K question, thinking about Humboldt County is a great example of how ESSA has helped get impact through an evidence-based intervention. Read by grade three. Grade th there's a lot of research that shows how critical being able to read by grade three, if not earlier, is to life outcomes. And so um, we supported uh, the, the county to essentially, to ultimately double the percentage of students who were reading by grade three from 24% to 48%. And so when you think about that, that means in, whether it's 75% or still a half, are still not reading by grade three right. in Nevada. And that is a result of the, f the failure of the continuum leading up to getting into kindergarten and having what you need to be able to be prepared. I mean, if you can just add, you know, it, and it's, there's an easy way to remember it. Um, I usually look for, like, street easy ways because I'm not a trained educator. I came to it by funny accident, which is that up until second or third grade, kids are learning to read. And then after that, they're reading to learn. And if they haven't hit that crossover, it's very hard to make it up later. It's not impossible. There are some people certainly can make that leap, but it is, it presents uh, an enormous struggle for them. So that's kind of the easy phrase to keep in mind of why this early stuff is so important. Could I just add one other thing? The, the, um, if you are I mean, the gap that we see when kids get to kindergarten is if you're born poor versus not being born poor, you show up having heard 30 million fewer words. Each individual shows up having heard 30 million fewer words, which if you don't think will make a difference, ask any kindergarten teacher out there. And second, I think as we move forward on this, we're going to find that what we're, try what we're really talking about here is zero to five, too. You know, that we're talking about interventions in the home before children are born to uh, help parents understand what they can do to help with, even if they're not literate themselves, with the literacy of their kids. It's part of why I've proposed in my education plan that we do a better job funding from the federal level um, home visits for people across the country because, for kids, because I think that'll make a difference and begin to show that, you know, early intervention really matters. Um, and and second, we also have to think about the workforce for this early childhood and where they're going to come from because. I mean, I travel the country now and travel my state, and I mean, it's amazing how poorly we're paying uh, the people that are teaching our youngest children, <laughs> as well as our K-12 teachers who are obviously still being paid as if 
we had a labor market that discriminated against women and said, you've got two choices, one's being a teacher and one's being a nurse. You know, that's been over for 40 or 50 years, but we're still running our system of education that way. We're unlikely to provide the quality we need at the, at the, at the earlier ages if we don't have a compensated workforce um, that we're treating like the professionals they deserve to be treated. Now some questions uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, so, uh, Senator Bennett, even school districts that have done exceptional things have had only limited success closing the gap between poor students and better off students. How much is addressing poverty an indispensable part of addressing educational gaps? I don't know who asked that question, but I, you know, I suppose we're not supposed to know. That's an amazingly important question, and I, if I, in the last 15 years of working on this, I've reached the conclusion that until we address poverty, we're, it shouldn't be an excuse for not doing everything we need to do for kids, and there is no excuse. for We're not trying hard enough, and we're treating America's children like they're someone else's children. I, I often say on the floor of the Senate, if, if the senators face the same odds for their kids and grandkids that America, poor people in America, there wouldn't be a person in the Senate because we would all go home to try to address the emergency that our family was confronting in terms of the unequal education that they were getting. I believe it's going to be very hard for us to get where we need to go without addressing poverty in this country. I think we should have a goal. Uh, our goal should be ending childhood poverty in America. One of the proposals I've made in this campaign and have been working on for years with Sherrod Brown, we actually have two bills. One's Bennett Brown, the other one's Brown Bennett. Bennett Brown is my more cherished of the two, <laughs> but, but, but I love them both. And what Bennett Brown is, is a massive increase to the child tax credit, which today pays about 2000 bucks for a kid. What we say is let's take it up to $3,600 for kids under the age of six and pay it out on a monthly basis so parents would actually get $300 a month per kid to raise their kid. Um, and and $250 a month per kid after the age of six. Columbia University has looked at this and they have said that if we pass this bill, um, we would cut childhood poverty in America by 40%. We would end $2 a day poverty. So the kids whose families are living on $2 a day, that would be done in America. And I can tell you, there is no education reform we could put in place that would make more of a difference than lifting that many kids out of poverty. And by the way, in this campaign season, let me point out, you could pass that and pay for it for less than 3% of what Medicare for All will cost. <coughs> Medicare for All is not going to make a difference to the kids that I work for in the Denver Public Schools. Reducing their poverty by 40% would make a massive difference. So the great news is there's something we can do about it if we elect people that are paying attention to it. And we need to remind ourselves the obvious point here, which is no kid asked to be born poor. This is a question of what kind of society do we want to live in? What is a just society? A just society is one where, you know, if, you, if you're born poor through no fault of your own and we have the means of lifting you up from there, we're going to do it. By the way, without adding a single bureaucrat to the federal government, we could achieve that. So that is a great question, and I, and I look forward to working with you on it. And an equally great response. No, you know, have, you know, look at that uh, Bennett Brown bill. Uh, so next question, will there be uh, jobs for all educated folks in the economy of the future? Is this for, for me? Or yeah, for, for um, uh, uh, will there be jobs? No, there won't. So we got to make sure that we train ourselves in ways that will make us adaptable to this changing economy. And pe sometimes people say, oh my God, you know, we have AI bearing down on us and it doesn't look like we're doing anything. Well, that's nothing new. We haven't done anything uh, for the last two generations. If you go home to my wife's hometown, which is one of the poorest communities in America, it's called Lee County, Arkansas, in the, in the, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, um, where there was mechanization of agriculture culture that started in 1970, the early 70s. Um, we've never replaced the jobs that have been lost in the Delta, and we've got no system in place for people to be retrained in a way, and we've got no theory of economic development that's done anything except have more and more people slide into poverty. And if we don't think imaginably about what the future is going to look like and how well trained and how skilled people are going to need to be, we're going to, we're going to have even more people displaced. On the other hand, 
there's huge potential that's going to come from technology as well. And the people that are going to harness that best are the people that are best educated. And I, so I think while it's, while it's not an answer most politicians will give you, um, I think education really is the key here. And it's, it's the reason why we have to redouble our efforts, because it's really, really hard. But that's what will really make a difference. And uh, any of you have a question? I have another question from the audience. Um, right. I think uh, we want to make sure that Senator Bennett uh, is able to keep with his schedule. Um, as a president, what experience would you look for in a U.S. Secretary of Education? The opposite of Betsy DeVos, for one thing. I mean, that's an easy applause line, but it's true. I, I've met a lot of people, including my colleagues, some of them, that are incredibly ignorant about what goes on, as I said earlier, in our schools and our classrooms. I don't think I've ever met somebody as ignorant as she is. It's really incredible. And she's a, an amazing example who's, of somebody who's allowed political ideology to blind them completely from, from the facts. We have charter schools in Denver. I'm going to say that right here. And, and, and I know there's mixed views about them here. But we don't have them the way Betsy DeVos would set them up. You know, the charters in Denver are accountable to the same school performance framework I described earlier. They have to take the same percent of special ed kids and the same percentage of English language learner kids. And some of them are great schools and some of them not so good. And the ones that are great, we want to have more of. And the ones that are lousy, we want to have fewer of. It's all based on the data. And that's what people have to sort of suffer through. The person I would want to be ideally the... Um, uh, Secretary of Education would be somebody who grew up in poverty themselves and somebody who's taught in a high poverty school. That's what I would like is the credential because I think that's a, that's a person who could not just uh, carry the education portfolio but carry a voice of the children from Denver and rural Colorado and rural New Hampshire, urban New Hampshire into a new administration and say you know, to HHS and the people responsible ha for housing and the people responsible for all the other stuff, are you thinking about, you know, where the kids really are? If I were president, one of the things I'd really want to do is break down the silos we have as the federal government. I've been on the receiving end at the local level, not just in the school district, but the city and county of Denver. And I know the decision, you know, let's g let people at the local level figure out their set of priorities for serving kids, and then let's have the federal government support imaginative people at the local level that are trying to do their job well rather than imagining that kids live their lives you know as recipients of dental care over here and housing over here and education over here that's not how kids live their lives they live their lives in neighborhoods as kids and our government policy should be flexible enough uh, to understand that and historically they haven't been Great. Well, um, I'd like to just uh, thank all of you for joining us here today. Uh, thanks to the UNH Carsey School, UNH uh, uh, Rudman Center. Uh, thanks to our two panelists. And most of all, thanks for the hopeful, thoughtful message uh, today, Senator Bennett. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.